It's my nerd world, and welcome to it. This week's show is brought to you by the all-new science fiction space opera Epic Embark, available now on Amazon.com. For those not familiar with the story or the book written by John Justice, hey, that's me. A uh, special message after the very short outro on the show this week. For episode 158, and a week where expectations were high and did not deliver, I have so much information to share with you this week. We've got leaked photos, legit leaked photos from episode 9. We're going to break it all down. Do I know? Do we know? Do we have the synopsis for the Ryan Johnson trilogy? Even if it isn't real, the potential of what Ryan Johnson can do based off of this synopsis has me really excited, plus a ton of listener feedback this week. Let's get to it. Nothing will stand in our way. I find your lack of faith disturbing. I will finish what you started. Who are you? I'm no one. There are stories about what happened. It's true. All of it. The Force. Calling to you. My nerd road. Just bet it in. So I'm watching Solo a Star Wars story last night. I had actually watched it uh, last weekend. Uh, been, and like I said on last week's show, it still remains true. I've been holding off on watching because I've been wanting to watch the uh, the Force Awakens, but I've been holding off on watching it simply because I've been waiting for um, some some inspirational information to drop, the title or a teaser, or with the leaks that we have today, that I may end up watching it tonight. But I'm watching Solo last night, and that movie is just so much fun. And I turned to my wife and I said, you know. If Solo, a Star Wars story, had been the only movie made post-Revenge of the Sith, so let's just live in a fantasy world for a brief moment where uh, Revenge of the Sith happens, Disney buys Lucasfilms, they decide they're not going to immediately do any more saga stories, and Solo, a Star Wars story is the first new Star Wars movie that we get after Revenge of the Sith. I think it does gangbusters in in the movie theater. Um, and I've mentioned before, I think if they had released it later in the year last year, it would have done a lot better. The movie is just so much, so much fun as a as a side story. And I, I really do love the the romance and the love story in that in that movie. The more that I watch Solo a Star Wars story, the more that story becomes, you know, more so than in previous viewings, Han Solo and, and Kira. And it makes that ending so heartbreaking when you kind of look at it as a somewhat of a of a of a sweet romance um, lens. It really does make that moment at the end where she doesn't go with him, just gut wrenching, and and leaves me really wanting more solo stories with Alden Ehrenreich and with Amelia Clark. And I really hope they're going to end up in the Cassian Andor television series. I know that the uh, Resistance podcast was talking about that possibility based on the timeline of where the Cassian Andor series is going to be placed. Uh, you could easily kind of pop in a Han Solo at some point in time, much in the same way we've had the cameos in more recently Resistance and, of course, in in Rebels. I'm going to get to, we got a lot to get to on the show today. I just wanted to spend a little bit of time sort of, you know, having a, a bit of a conversation beyond the lengthy conversation that we are going to be having with all these leaks that have been laid out before us. Um, this is the part of the show, for those that are newer to the show, this is the part of the show where I kind of just express my fandom for Star Wars before we get into uh, the actual sort of content that we have to to share. Um, watching Solo last night and hearing a lot of commentary around the prequel trilogy, um, 
around revisiting the prequel trilogy, hearing that on podcasts as well. It's a very interesting time for the pod, for the Star Wars podcast community because we've had so little information, and we'll talk a little bit about that. I personally think it's a mistake, and I'll explain why. Um, I, I, I tend to pride myself, and you guys acknowledge this quite often, and I appreciate it as being Mr. Positivity. Um, but I think that Disney right now is making a couple of mistakes, in my, in my opinion, and I'll tell, you what they, I'll tell you what they are. But because of the absence of anything official coming out, um, really apart from Resistance right now and some of the book news that has dropped, a lot of people have been talking about the prequels. And I wanted to take a moment, it's been a while since I've mentioned this, but I wanted to take a moment and throw out a bit of love for Attack of the Clones. And that's become the most recent Star Wars movie that I think gets, apart from The Last Jedi, that gets the most criticism as of as of late. And we've been down this road before. It was the Phantom Menace for a long time, but I think history has shown um, quite a bit of appreciation for the Phantom Menace over the years. And now it seems like Attack of the Clones has replaced it. And I love Attack of the Clones. Uh, I, I there's 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 clunky stuff in all of Star Wars, and certainly there's some clunky moments in that as well. But I just that movie is so rich in its detail, in its scope, in its action. That final forty five minutes in Attack of the Clones is spectacular, and for this viewer, being the hopeless romantic that I am, theming this somewhat with Solo, a Star Wars story, and the Han and Kira relationship, and this certainly applies to Raylo and the potential for what's going to happen in 9, but certainly what we got in in 8, I really do like that romance that takes place between Anakin and, and Padme in Attack of the Clones. George Lucas was going for a very specific old style of filmmaking and dialogue. And I know a lot of people see that as clunky and it's not as accessible as some of the, the more quippy modern script writing that we get. Right. But if you're able to move past that, it's setting up for the tragedy that takes place with Anakin in, in episode three, uh, I, I really love what they did and what George Lucas did in attack of the clones. Uh, and and one of the reasons why I like it, and then we're going to dive into all this stuff, because you're probably waiting, John, shut up and stop talking about prequels and get to the spoiler stuff. But n- no, it's my show, and you can skip forward if you want. Um, <laughs> but w- what I like of what George did in Attack of the Clones, and it's very similar to what happened in, in Solo, a Star Wars story, and it's something that I also tried to do. I actually got a little bit of criticism because of what I did in the in the book Embark that I wrote. But I like the fact that... When you get later on in Attack of the Clones and that moment before they go out to face their to face their demise in the uh, in the arena on on Geonosis. Uh, and I know it's clunky and it's cheesy, but when Anakin finally realizes that what Padme that he was right. That's the part of it that I love. You know, when when Padme turns to him and tells him that you know, I truly deeply love you and before we die i wanted you to know and anakin had felt that the whole you know the whole movie from the moment that he he saw her again after all those years he obviously had those feelings for her felt like she felt the same way but she was denying him until that moment at the end and i just i i i I really do love those moments they're such sweet and emotional moments, and it's one of the things that I loved about, and I love about Solo too, and I've, I, and I have said this before, but it's the fact that they didn't go sort of the will they, won't they typical route in Solo, you know, and they, when when he finds Kira again, she's not angry with him on Dryden Voss's sail barge, or not a sail barge, but his ship, right? Um, she's not mad m- mad at him for leaving. She understood. She wanted him to leave her behind. Uh, and she doesn't push Han away during the film. She brings herself. Obviously, she still loves him. She still cares about him to the point where she's even surprised when L3 tells her that, you know, that that boy is in love with you. And she's like, no, he's not. Uh, I And I, I, I love that. And again, it just makes that end part where they have to, to split up, you know, that much more um, gut wrenching. I, when people talk about the love doesn't work in star Wars, I just, I disagree. I really do. 
you know, what we're getting and what we got in nine is very different, very complicated uh, in in Ben Solo and, and and Ray. And I'll keep saying it. I really hope that they that Ryan uh, that uh, the J.J. Abrams does that justice and 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 takes that and runs with it in nine. Uh, that's what I'm. That's what I'm hoping for. But as I've always said, I will be happy with whatever they whatever they give us. All right. So I spent enough time on that. Let's um. Let's move forward, and first, let's get into the potential of what Ryan Johnson's trilogy could be based off of a leak on Reddit. There has been an awakening. Have you felt it? All right, so do I believe that this particular leak is true? Uh, I'm going to say probably 80% no. You know, We'll give it a 20%. It, it, it could be. Somebody posted this on the on the Reddit's page, on the Reddit Star Wars discussion page. This was taken from 4chan. Anybody could have gone and written this. Uh, it seems very random, but the idea I like. Somebody wrote that Ryan Johnson handed in his outline for his trilogy. Okay. What I like about this outline, and I'll share it with you in one second. What I like about it is, even if it's not real... It shows what could be done. Like this idea, in my opinion, would absolutely work. So this is what was posted on Reddit and somebody claiming this was Ryan Johnson's outline for the trilogy. It takes place right before the invention of the hyperdrive and is about the very first person to ever feel the force. An orphan girl who seemingly uses sleight of hand to steal from markets in the street so she doesn't starve. As hyperspace travel grows nearer and nearer, the girl is caught and her powers scare people. They want her executed, but the king of the planet declares that he will raise her as his own. The story kicks off when he dies and the king's natural son takes the throne and begins raising an army as he's worried about what an uh, interconnected galaxy will bring while the girl searches for the truth behind her mysterious force. Okay, so no way to know whether or not this is legitimate. The reason why I wanted to share with, with it with you is because I think that is an amazing idea. And even if it's not true, I mean, I wish I could go and I would. I want to go write that story. Um, even if it's not true, it does expose the potential and show the potential of what a Ryan Johnson trilogy could be about. Like when we ask the question, well, what are they going to do? What is it going to be about? When you look at the potential for the Benioff and Wise Game of Thrones guys and the tr- and the and the movies that they might do, going back in time. Right. The easy answer is to go back and do Knights of the Old Republic and and the the expectations that we have and the stories that are in our head based off of what's now legends and used to be the expanded universe. Right. We default to what we know. I love when new ideas are presented. And to me, this type of story is just ripe for for a trilogy. Yes, we have another potential virgin birth. But I like that idea, too. This is what Star Wars is about. It's about individuals finding the power within them, discovering that power, the new, a new hero's journey. And the part of this, the only part of this thing that makes me go, that sounds right up Ryan Johnson's alley, is this idea that she uses the sleight of hand to steal from markets in the street so she doesn't starve. Like, that is something that I could absolutely see um, Ryan Johnson doing. Like, I could see him making that. Somebody had posted in the comment section to this potential outline for Ryan Johnson's trilogy and said, you know, from it'd be interesting if he went from The Last Jedi to the to the first Jedi. Uh, and it also would make sense from for those of us that kind of went, yeah, it makes sense for Ryan Johnson to go back in time. There was a rumor out there that he was going forward in time. I'm cool with that, too. But... I think it makes a lot of sense that with Ryan Johnson doing what he did with the Force in The Last Jedi and kind of opening up the mythology a little bit while re-explaining it, the way that he makes movies and his classic approach, um, I, I personally believe that Ryan Johnson's films have a timeless appeal to them. That's what is going to make The Last Jedi stand out among Star Wars movies for decades to come, in my opinion. 
is that The Last Jedi really does have a very, across the board, whether it's writing, whether it's the visual style, it just has a very classic movie feel feel to it. And much like the other films, it is going to stand the test of time. But even better, because it's not going to be a product of the technology that is going to age it. When you go back and watch the prequel trilogy, that's a part of the prequel trilogy that's a bummer to me. Um Whereas the original trilogy, you have the nostalgia of the special effects of the time, and we've just all become accustomed to that, and we think it's fantastic. I don't think there's a lot of nostalgia for early CGI work, and I think that the the biggest weight around the prequel trilogy is, while it's grand in scope and the visual effects are good, they are not where they are today. And to me, they date those films quite a bit like a very sort of in-between stage. I think the Ryan Johnson and The Last Jedi is a is a perfect mix of storytelling, of visual interpretation of the Star Wars universe, um, the way it's shot, the sheen on the film. It gives that movie an incredibly timeless, timeless feel. So Ryan Johnson going back and doing a story, almost a Force origin story like this, I think would be would be absolutely amazing. So, again, there's very little chance that this is new. Whoever wrote it, though, in my opinion, did a should pitch that to Disney and Lucasfilm because <laughs> I think that is an absolutely um, just – I think it's a – I think it's a uh, – I think it's a fantastic, uh, a fantastic idea. All right, uh, let's go ahead and move on. We got some spoilers to talk about, a whole bunch of photos. I'll tell you where you can look at them, uh, but let's go ahead and break it all down. All right, so before we dive into the photos, I'm looking at them right here. Um, if you're online, depending on where you're listening to this, if you go to the uh, the Podbean channel, depending on where you listen, I put a I put a link, or I actually put the photo in the description of the uh, of the podcast this week. Uh, also, my main website, mynerdworld.net. If you go to Star Wars podcast on the homepage, you put your mouse over the uh, one of the boxes, and you'll see the the uh, the logo for the My Nerd World podcast. Um, there's a f- the photo is available there, so you can take a look at these yourself if you don't want to go search in Reddit. So uh, again, e- either in the description for the podcast this week, but if you don't see it there, you can go to MyNerdWorld.net and just click on the link for um, again for the Star Wars podcast, and you'll you'll see the the link to this. Uh, I will go through the list of these characters and what we see here and give you my uh, give you my thoughts on them before i do that let me let me lay out my my current complaint we all had an expectation uh that uh well, not all of us but a lot of us did the internet did right uh that we were going to get a title i really thought that we'd get a title around the 23rd of last month i didn't think that we would go past the same timeline of the last jedi and getting a title for episode nine and that didn't happen uh, nothing happened, obviously, over the Super Bowl. Then we had the Bob Iger Disney earnings call that took place on Tuesday. Plus, we had the Star Wars, Star Wars show returning Wednesday. Plus, you had Anthony Daniels tweeting out these really cryptic tweets that people are trying to decipher, don't really know what it means. There's some speculation that Disney might go and release all the films in the theater leaning into episode nine, which is something that I suggested and thought they should do, but that hasn't been announced. Nothing has been announced at all. Even with the Star Wars show that came back for the first time since the end of last year, I was, and I'll be honest, I'll be, I was disappointed. They had an interview, which was really interesting, with um, Elijah Wood, who does one of the voices on on Resistance. They alluded to potential information coming out, but there's been just just this crickets coming from Disney and Lucasfilm over episode nine. And it seems clear to me that they're trying to bring the fandom to a fever pitch. Okay. And that's definitely the case. If you go to Twitter and just use it as the example, if you go to Twitter um, or listen to any of the podcasts in the podcast community, you'll kind of hear the, 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 the level of disappointment that we don't have anything. I think this is a mistake because I feel like Disney needs to feed the fandom, just a, the hardcore fandom, just a little bit. Uh, and I'll just speak for me. I, it's a bummer. We do it to ourselves. We lay out these expectations and these, these 
made up concocted sort of deadlines of when we think stuff's going to happen because we're so excited to hear new information and then it doesn't we end up disappointing ourselves when we really don't have anything official to go off of except for past release schedules you have pablo hidalgo on twitter who's part of the story group and he's out there tweeting like you know why do you guys think the trailer's coming out today by the way i don't know the title and uh, I don't know anything, but we may not get the title and the teaser until until April and celebration. And he's putting this stuff out there, and that just, uh, you know, and again, we it's whatever you do with it. I wish that Disney would just put out just a little something, even if you don't give the title. And I've said this before: when it comes to the Star Wars show, bring on somebody in charge of production for Nine to talk about some facet of Nine that has nothing to do with any leaks. Working with BB-8, how BB-8 operation has improved since um you know the force awakens you know what 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 has changed since then little snippets of interviews with cast members who aren't giving away any details but are simply commenting on somebody who asked them a star wars question i mean cast members dodging questions from star wars would be interesting but there are a thousand people you can interview about star wars and the new movies and not give anything away just to add a little bit to the to the conversation yeah we're going to a lot of new worlds in this movie and we'll be visiting some some older places it's exciting to go and look at how they looked before to make a match and designing these new worlds i mean all that stuff is enough to give the fandom something to chew on because without anything, this is what happens. We get a leak like I have here in front of me, and I'm going to spend a whole bunch of time talking about this. It's not official, but Disney could have easily have filled the 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 could have easily have thwarted lengthier conversations about leaked materials with a little bit of official information. You know, even just an outfit. I mean, I'm looking at the new look for Kylo Ren here, and I'm failing to sort of rationalize why Disney couldn't have just thrown that out there in a, in a benign way on Twitter and let the fandom just go and run with it. I mean, you'd have clickbait stories and podcast conversations to talk about for two weeks. So I, I just personally think it's a mistake that they're not putting anything at all. It's it, not even just a title. I mean, the title would certainly do that. I'm more and more of the opinion that the reason why they're holding off on the title is that I think it's going to be a a rather revealing title i don't think anybody has guessed it yet and for whatever reason i'm wondering if there is material that they want to put out with the title so they add some context to it like i'm wondering we, we know there's a teaser out there making star wars.net jason ward has mentioned that there is a teaser it was four minutes they've cut it down it's a tearjerker and i'm wondering if the title requires a bit of context that a teaser can provide and that's why they're holding off but we're in the situation where we received nothing in the way of Episode Nine news. Um, I'm excited for the Mandalorian, but I'm way more excited for the movies that I am anything for the you know for the for the for the Episode Nine than I'm in anything else. And I just I think that Disney misses the boat in not taking advantage of how hardcore the fandom is and how much time they would spend talking about really ancillary things that don't spoil anything for the movie but would still help to generate hype. Because right now, you just have a kind of a bunch of frustrated podcasters looking for stuff to talk about. This week, though, we have a lot to talk about. All right, so you should have have uh, you should have had enough time to go and check out this photo. So what this is, and uh, you know what I'll do? Let me, let me go ahead and go back to... Um, I'm going to go back and read the original uh, post on this So to give you the context of where this image came from. And again, if you go to mynerdworld.net and click on the Star Wars podcast, you can see it there. Or... Um, depending on what format you listen to the show uh, on, it should be in the show notes. I put that up on Podbean, and that goes out to iTunes and and um, and Stitcher as well, I believe, and the iHeartRadio app. All right. So these images, Jedi Paxis says, these images come courtesy of a source who has previously provided me information on previous films that were eventually proven to be correct. This individual wishes to remain an anonymous for obvious reasons, and that's why I'm posting this on his behalf. The images have been compiled into a collage with the unimportant sections of each image having been altered in an attempt to obscure who and where they came from. Okay. So when you look at the photos, you'll understand what he's saying. The ed around the edges of the photographs, they've uh, they've kind of widened out, so you can't really tell where the uh, where the source was. All right. Um, I would also like to note that the images H and O 
an H and O on the photograph if you're looking at it or not looking at it. That is Ray wearing white and old Lando. And I'll explain what he looks like here in a moment. Um, Let's see. He says uh, they corroborate what Jason from Making Star Wars recently said about Ray's hair and Lando's costumes in the film. I received these images prior to Making Star Wars article being published, which not only leads credibility to Jason's sources, but also confirms to me that my source is solid. In addition to those two images, there's plenty here to analyze and uh, and uh, discuss and generally obsess over, and he is absolutely correct in that. So a bit about Jason Ward's from MakingStarWars.net and his um, his leaks. He has mentioned the Knights of Ren play a predominant role in the in the film, and that from what he's been told, they return from the beyond um, with some new information. He also mentioned there's a MacGuffin in the film that everybody's after, but he doesn't know what it is. Somebody had put had put forward a theory, which I really thought was cool. Somebody had put forward a theory that, um, you know, maybe the MacGuffin ends up being Ben Solo. Like, maybe we get a Ben Solo leaving the First Order earlier in the film than we than we expect, and people are after him. I don't think that's the case. I just thought it was an interesting, it was an interesting uh, uh, idea. I'm wondering, and then I promise we'll start talking about the photos. I can't help but wonder if if we have a MacGuffin in the film. I'm wondering if we don't get episode nine being a story crafted more like A New Hope was. One of the things that I love so much about A New Hope and what was the driving story factor for when I wrote my science fiction space opera Embark was I wanted I wanted that story to be simple in what the goal was to achieve okay um the the follow-up book that I'm writing is not that it's following very much sort of this trend of the Empire Strikes Back where The characters are being put through these different circumstances. We're not necessarily after a particular item. What I loved about A New Hope, and what I love about A New Hope, especially as a kid, was that it was clear. We had Death Star plans. The Death Star plans needed to get here to the Rebels to defeat the Death Star before the Death Star arrived to defeat the Rebels. I just, that whole, there was a clear goal. Get the plans to the Rebels so they can go and destroy the Death Star. I love that. You have this driving plot line. It's simple to understand. It's not convoluted. And we haven't had that in a Star Wars film in a while. You do get something like that in Return of the Jedi. They have to go to Endor. They have to bring the shields down so they can destroy the Death Star. Pretty straightforward. Okay. I'm wondering if in, 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 uh, in episode nine, which I think would be cool, if we're going to get that. If we're going to get, there's going to be a MacGuffin driving the story. Everybody's going to be after this one particular thing. For Kylo Ren, it's love. Because he's after Ray's heart. Maybe that's the MacGuffin. Maybe the MacGuffin is the love that Kylo Ren, Ben Solo, wants from Ray. <laughs> I would be down with that. <laughs> I think that would be great. It's more of an emotional MacGuffin, right? <laughs> it's more of a, you know, more, more, more of a, a need to fill the void and desire of, you know, when somebody wants, just wants to be, Kylo just wants, Ben just solo just wants to be loved. So the MacGuffin is him just wanting to get the love from this one particular person. All right, sorry. I, I'm, I'm sure it's something that's a physical object. So that's where the, um, the Knights of Ren may come into play. They may have found out or needed to find something from beyond. I can't help but wonder if this is going to tie into the, to all of the films, right, and bringing us back to, you know, the the prequel trilogy and how these all tie together. Okay, so, again, I just wanted to throw it out there that I, I would be excited if we had sort of a, a very straightforward, this is the goal-oriented um, main plot that our characters all have to work through while we wrap up this uh, this saga. So, let's get to these, uh, to these photos. I'm going to run through the list here and then talk about them. Um, well, you know, I'll just go through the list. They have all the photos here, and they're 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 labeled with letters, and then they have the description. So, um, in the in the A position, we have a new alien, 
they say con- the, the person that tagged these says concept art slash reference photo. These, I mean, I guess they could be concept art as opposed to reference photo. Um, a lot of these just look like what things are going to look like in the film. They don't necessarily look like concept art. Be that as it may, um, the first one we have concept art for this new alien. Looks pretty cool. Looks like a looks. He looks a little bit like Yoda wearing goggles, slightly whiter skin. Um, B is is interesting because it confirms some leaks, and we'll talk about this. The the reveal of these photographs from Episode Nine end up substantiating a leak that came out a couple, about a month ago that we're going to revisit in the show this this week as well. So B is the new droid that will annoy BB-8. And from what we've heard, he's called Dio. People have described him having a cone-shaped head. I thought that he flew around. It looks like he's on a mono wheel. I'm looking at him, and you'll see him in the photo. He looks pretty cool. He reminds me of, if you uh, remember the cartoon Spy vs. Spy. He used to crack me up as a kid. I just, I love But they had the... Uh, they were like these birds, right? Were they supposed to be birds? I just know they had long faces. They look like the head of this of this droid. He's got a he's got uh, some green accents, uh, and he looks cool. I, I I dig him. I'm I'm curious to see. Um. Oh, you know what? Too. Hold on a second. Let me. Uh... Huh. That's funny. So um. So the uh the I won't have time to put this on the podcast, but this this droid Dio. If you look at the photo, he looks just like. The he's got a he's got this cone shaped head, but his body is very similar to the droid that speaks to in Attack of the Clones of all movies. In Attack of the Clones, when Obi Wan goes to see Dexter Jetster, and do you want a cup of Java juice? He's on this wheel. That's what it looks like. That's pretty cool. Um, C is Richard E. Grant as a First Order officer. So that go ahead and confirms that. And it is exactly what you would think. It's a black First Order officer, and it's Richard E. Grant. So there you go. Uh, D is a resistance soldier. Uh, w- one thing that sticks out to me with all the character photos is they're all dressed very lightly. I know that the um, makingstarwars.net had said there was, there was a, they saw an ice castle, an ice cave. And that snow on a planet. These photos, all of the the characters are all dressed somewhat in light attire, not necessarily that of uh, of snow. This particular, if this is concept art, um, has a very sort of Vietnam look to it, in the way the helmet shaped, and the way that the uh, the the um, the resistance outfit is. Um, e is uh, Dominic Monaghan as a resistance um, officer. Pretty plain. It's Dominic with his beard. He's wearing. Um, a shirt that looks a little bit like Poe Dameron's shirt from the other films without the jacket and uh, gray pants. Um, F, we have uh, new alien concept art. Looks like uh, Constable Zuvio, to be honest. A different color palette, but looks like Constable Zuvio. Um, then we have a young Mon Cal uh, reference photo. Uh, a little bit lighter, but looks like a Mon Calamari. Um, H, I, and J. So H, I, J, and K. Uh, this is Ray... Kylo, Kylo, and Poe. I'm going to double back to those. I want to go through the rest of the photos, and then I want to wipe out talking about their character designs, because this is um, this, these are the big reveals, in my opinion. Um, L, we get a, a new alien mask. Looks very similar to the aliens that uh, JJ created with the, the, the eyes up top and the elongated um, face. Um, M, we have another, uh, another horned pilot reference photo. Looks interesting. Um, ends, ends an interesting one. It shows an individual holding a staff in a, in a black outfit. Um, the face is very gray with big black eyes. Somebody made a comment that it, the, the, the character looks frightening and that maybe it's a Knight of Wren. They just thought that the, uh, the, the design was unique and that it kind of stuck out. Um, o is, uh, Lando. Uh, it's an old Lando. Looks great. Wearing, uh, he's got a cape, black pants, and then he's wearing a yellow shirt, and uh, it is very reminiscent to how Lando looked in Solo. Um, I, it's a little bit surprised. I mean, I guess almost like they lifted Lando out of Solo, a Star Wars story, and then just put his clothes on on the older Lando. I was a little bit taken back because there would be a lot of time between that, but if yellow is a color that Lando likes, then it makes sense. Um, I'm going to skip P. I'm going to go back to P here in just a second. Q is just a new alien costume. It's kind of a blobby alien with big eyes on his head and spikes sticking out the side of his face. Looks cool. All right. Um, let's talk P, and then we'll talk about our main characters. P on the list are new alien costumes. Okay. So 
These are interesting because we know that they're from the Wadi, the Wadi Rum, the Jordan set. Wadi Rumdi. Um, we know these are from the Jordan set. There were cardboard cutouts placed in the desert on that Jordan set. A lot of people speculating, is it Jakku? Is it Jeddah? Is it Tatooine? A lot of different leaks kind of swirling around which of these desert planets we're going to go to. My money is still on Jeddah. I know I've had people that have pushed back um, on me, especially in the, in the comment section. My money is on Jeddah. I think that makes sense to go back to Jeddah, given how important it is. And depending on what the MacGuffin is, if it's something related to the Jedi, and that would be important. So we know that these were on the Wadi Rum D set, so the Jordan set. This is what I find more interesting. And I don't know if there's anything to this, but these aliens look almost exactly like the concept art. And I posted a picture of this on in the in the notes for the podcast and also at mynerdworld.net. I took a photo from one of my art books and posted it up there with it. These look just like the original concept art for the Nemoidians. For those that do not know, uh, the concept art for the Phantom Menace, the Nemoidians originally were going to have these long faces, right? With these sort of... Uh, they kind of morphed the Nemoidians into what the Geonosians looked like. Uh, very long snouts, eyes at the top. But uh, when you when you go and look at the concept art, and I actually have it right here. What I have here in my hands is the art of Star Wars The Phantom Menace. This is an excerpt from the book. I believe it came with the... Um, I believe this came with the uh, the VHS set. But you open it up in the beginning, and sure enough, there's a shot. And this is what I posted. Um, this was Newt Gunray's troop inspection. They're gray in the book, but they look just like these aliens in P. Uh, and he said, uh, when this sketch was drawn, George Lucas had yet to describe the scene. Doug Chang began toying with some ideas of his own, and ultimately this sketch evolved into a key production painting. This, Im this image demonstrates the design philosophy of one, combined different textures and styles to create a timeless whole. The hangar's old stone structure is contrasted against the chrome starfighters and the unusual technology of the Trade Federation, yet all these elements come together uh, to create a fantastic yet conviction con convicting uh, convincing, excuse me, uh, uh, fictional reality. And again, the idea was that the uh, the Nemoidians created the battle droids to look like them. That's what these creatures look like. Now, you'd have to retcon. I don't think this is... We're, it could be Geonosis, and that's what I find interesting, too. Is that a lot of people have been focusing these other planets, but I think it would be fascinating if it was Geonosis. Now, you'd have to do some retconning. Because I don't know if we've ever really established that the Nemoidians created the battle droids. We know they had a factory. And we know that the the Geonosians kind of ended up looking like the battle droids did. And I think that's where the idea morphed from. It morphed from the Nemoidians being the ones to create the battle droids to the Geonosians being, being the ones to create the battle droids. And so that their heads are going to look more like the battle droids. But to be honest with you, these guys in these colorful robes look way more like battle droids than the geonosians do okay so i just found that interesting curious to get your thoughts i'm wiping out on a bunch of robed figures let's get to the good stuff so starting with poe dameron's outfit very reminiscent actually not reminiscent it is it's pretty much the same attire just a better look at it um that we saw in the leaked photos early early on of them on a on a grassy hill him and uh him and ray uh i'm sorry him and finn He's got uh, some gray pants on, boots, uh, a tan uh, tan shirt, a bandolier it looks like, and, a, and kind of a cloak, like a, a scarf around his neck. Looks great. Uh, it, 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 does, it does sort of evoke, a, um, again, a lighter look, more, I want to say military, but more guerrilla style, and that would fit with what uh, Oscar Isaac has said in regards to, and even uh, John Boyega said, you know, in regards to war in this film and guerrilla tactics and potentially the um, the resistance rebels trying to go and rec recruit individuals. All right, so let's spin over to, to Ray's outfit. Ray's outfit's really interesting because the, the leak that, that Jason Ward had was that 
Ray was going to have her hair back in the the toggles, in the three buns like she had in The Force Awakens. There was discussion uh, based off that leak on whether or not this meant we'd be getting some type of perhaps flashback to Jakku with her wearing uh, her hair that way in order to achieve that. Some people were speculating because of the footage that they could be using for for Leia. Uh, we know that in one of the first teasers, there was an image of Leia handing the lightsaber over to Maz Kanata. So the speculation when we look at Ray's outfit, which is very reminiscent to, to what she wore, although it is different. I'm actually looking at them both right here. Um, it is very reminiscent. Uh, it is it is different. So because it is different, to me, that does sort of put to rest the idea that she's um, dressed this way because she's supposed to mimic what she looked like in The Force Awakens because it's going to be some type of flashback scene. Okay, so dispensing with that, I have the Black Series figure in my hand, and I'm looking at the Ray figure. So we're back to the over-the-shoulder sash where one side is longer than the other and it connects. Um, she has shorter sleeves than she had before. Um, does still have, it looks like, on her left-hand side like she did in... Boy, this is really similar. So let me go with the differences uh, uh, otherwise. So the belt's very the same. Very much the same. Uh, it has this, uh, this slung bag off to the side, it looks like. Um, the over-the-shoulder sh wrap is more white, but she does still have on her left arm the brown wrapping like she had before. The leggings seem a little bit more straight and defined, cap uh, capri pants, um, than what she had before. So, I don't know. Uh, this, I, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave this one open because there is a part of me that looks at her outfit and says that it's new, but I'm trying to figure out what the justification would be as to why she would be dressed in such similar garb as she did in the original movie. Um, so let's play with this idea before we talk at length about Kylo Ren, just real quick. So if we look back at the design of previous protagonists in the film, and I guess Anakin Skywalker is probably the best one. Uh, his outfits changed, but not more like in, 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 in color palette, right? Um, can't really take Phantom Menace into account because he's just a kid. But when you look at the way that Hayden Christ uh, Christensen was dressed in his costume in Attack of the Clones and in, Re and in Revenge of the Sith, uh, it was very similar to what Ray is wearing, right? We sort of have this standard over the shoulder V of the, of the wrappings, right? That come around. Uh, we beefed them up a bit. I say we like I made the movie. They were beefed up a bit in Revenge of the Sith, but the outfit wasn't all that different than what it was in Attack of the Clones. Okay, so you go to Luke Skywalker. Luke Skywalker's a different ballgame altogether because uh, I think the Rey's outfit was meant to evoke Luke's somewhat in The fan in the Force Awakens. Ryan Johnson certainly changed the outfit and added the gray, which I love. Um, I think a lot of that had to, was a was very much a stylistic choice, especially given um, that that particular outfit that she wore when she changed from the beginning of the film, going on her galactic space date with a Kylo Ren on the Supremacy, uh, was a, was a very specific to make it unique and different and dress her up for that scene. Okay, so. It raises the question, what happens to Ray's outfit in Episode Nine, And if this is indeed a brand new outfit, which it looks like it is, she's reverting back a bit to what she's used to wearing. Does this mean she's going back to Jakku? Does this mean that she's not embraced her training as a, as a Jedi? You know, when we got to Luke in, in Return of the Jedi, you know, he's wearing all black. And that was initially Lucas's idea. Lucas was uh, Lucas had said that by the end of um, Return of the Jedi, that was supposed to be the sort of standard look for for Jedi's. Like when we would go back to the Phantom Menace, you would see Obi Wan and Qui Gon Jinn wearing outfits similar to what Luke wore at the end of Return of the Jedi, and then he opted when he made the Phantom Menace to give them more of sort of a make the Jedi attire match. Um, what 
Obi-Wan did, right? Make all the Jedi attire match that way. So, I don't know. This is interesting to me. This is not what I expected for Rey. I did not expect it to kind of revert back to what it was before. And I'm... It looks great. She looks fantastic. But it really does, in my mind, raise the question of, okay, that... I, I would have expected her to be wearing something different, not something so similar to The Force Awakens, and I wonder why that is. All right. Kylo Ren. Uh, one piece of information that is also out there is that somebody who has been known to have credible information has stated, and this has also been apparent in a couple of other leaks that I think are somewhat credible, that Kylo Ren most likely will not be wearing the mask the whole movie, that he may only be wearing it for the first half of the movie. However confirmation here that Kylo Ren does indeed put his helmet back together. Looking at the photo, J in the leaked pictures, it shows Kylo's helmet. It shows the red substance gluing it back together. It is a patchwork job, and it looks, in my opinion, it looks amazing. Somebody had done a dummy sort of Photoshop version of what they thought it was going to look like, and it wasn't too far off the mark. That helmet was pretty jacked up in The Last Jedi. And from what I can tell in this sort of low-res, pixelated image that I, I brought together, they did a really good job of trying to make the helmet look like it did before it was broken, but in such a way where Kylo had to go and put it back together and did the best job he could. It looks fantastic. His outfit as a whole is really interesting because... It is really, with the helmet on, a combination of what he looked like in The Force Awakens um, versus what he looked like in The Last Jedi. When we get to The Last Jedi, in The Force Awakens, he had this really cool hood-torn, angled cowl. Right, J.J. Abrams said he wanted him to have a wanted him to have a, a cape and a hood. And the way that that was designed was sort of like this three piece: the cape, the cowl kind of flows, looks tattered along with the hood. What they've done, then when you get to The Last Jedi, you have just the cape. I'm actually looking at the action. You have the, the cape over his shoulders with the helmet, no hood. What he has now is a combination. It's the hood with, with the cape, but it doesn't look like it has the cowl anymore, and it looks absolutely fantastic. I mean, I'm super excited for the way that he looks with this. And that helmet looks incredible. So I, I, I love everything that I'm seeing so far. Right. And somebody made a comment that, you know, give me outfits, give me, you know, give me these types of leaks um, over the title any day of the any day of the week. And I'll gladly go and take it. It's just great to finally go and see the first bit of non-official official episode nine um, uh, images. And again, it's a bummer that Disney and Lucasfilm just haven't been feeding us a little something else because this is going to dominate all the podcasts. Now, right? I mean, unless that's what Disney wants and they're cool with it, and maybe they are. That could all be part of the process, and it really should be. If you're Disney and Lucasfilm, you got to, you're going to have to have an understanding that this stuff is going to end up getting out there in in one way, shape, or form. And so maybe you just kind of expect that. Well, it's going to be the case. This stuff's going to leak out there. Why try to go and and fight it? People speculating, by the way, that the um that the title won't be dropped until Celebration. I don't agree with that. I I tend to think that people's assumptions that they'll announce the title when they wrap production, which is what everybody keeps saying, uh, and they haven't wrapped production yet. Uh, that should be very soon. To wait for the title until Celebration, in my opinion, would be a mistake because we're going to get more leaks like this. The toys are already being made, and usually right around now. I actually went back and looked at the year of The Last Jedi, and yeah, right around now, right about now, we got our first look at the packaging. Uh, and the first look at Ray's hair being down. I remember there was a whole podcast about Ray with her hair down. So for Disney to not give us the title prior to celebration, I firmly am of the opinion that we're going to end up um, getting it before then if Disney doesn't go and um, give it to us officially. All right, so one more quick um, item here, and then we're going to uh, dive into all the fantastic listener feedback this week. But... These leaked photos do confirm other leaks that were out there prior. Most specifically, an individual who went to a Disney marketing presentation. So I wanted to revisit this now that we know that this person was credible because they have a lot of good information here. All right. 
Um, they went to this marketing presentation where they discussed all things Star Wars for 2019, mostly focused on marketing, but they talked about different projects that showed a ton of images and concept art. Uh, I'm just in a, uh, I just, I realize I'm just an anonymous person on the internet, so I take all this information for what it's worth, but I wanted to share it with you. So, and again, this ends up lining right up with the leaks that I have in front of me. So, they talk about Galaxy's Edge, they talked at length about the new theme park. Um, I'm not going to get into that, you know, if you, the, the, um, I don't want to spend a ton of time talking about Gal- Galaxy's Edge on this, on the Star Wars podcast. I think it's great, I can't wait to go. But I'll be honest with you, I, it, the Galaxy's Edge doesn't matter to me until I go. <laughs> I just, it's a theme park. That's cool. But they're not the stories, and not anything I'm watching at home, so, you know, I'm not going to spend a ton of time on that. All right. Uh, Galaxy of Adventures. Uh, looks like this info was just announced, so no real new info here. 30 or so animated shorts, one to two minutes long. This is key in reintroducing the old characters to the younger fans. I've really been enjoying the Galaxy of Adventures, and I do wonder if this aligns with the speculation that they're going to re-release all the movies this year leading into Episode Nine. I think that would be a very wise move. There's a lot of fans out there that have never been able to see the original trilogy on the big screen, and you've got a bunch of young fans now who are digesting these Galaxy of Adventures that I think would love to go and see these films on the big screen as well. All right. Uh, Fallen Order video game coming out in November takes place about five years after Revenge of the Sith follows the main character. His name is Cal. He is a Padawan that survived the efforts to kill all the remaining Jedi. Not a ton of gameplay info, but some of the other storylines that he has a mentor figure, a woman whose name is is uh, Ceres. The only other thing I remember is them talking about the other characters. They would come across uh, some from um, they would come across from some of the comics. Uh, they mentioned the ninth sister and second sister, something about Inquisitors. I wish I could remember more about this. They showed a ton of artwork, so that's kind of cool for those that are, you know, Rebels uh, Rebels fans. Uh, the Mandalorian, and again, this is all stuff that came out a couple of months ago, but again, it's credible based off the nine stuff, which I'm about to get to. Uh, sizzle reel of John Favreau talking about how he's excited to delve into some of the EU for the Mandalorian. They talked about different directors as well. The main thing I remember is that the central plot ar- revolves around a main character and a baby. I guess the Mandalorian encounters a baby on one of his missions that he's supposed to kill, but instead of that, he ends up saving it. And a lot of the rest of the story revolves around their growing relationship and his efforts to keep the child safe and protected. You know, they say baby. I wonder if they mean adolescent. They showed a ton of artwork and stills. They spent a decent amount of time talking about the Mandalorian's armor and how it goes through changes and upgrades. They mentioned the large uh, woman character who's sort of the chief of theirs. I don't remember her name and whether or not she was a villain. They also talked a lot about different planets and terrains, but I don't remember too many specific details. There was um, Taika Waititi, Taika Waititi uh, the uh, director of Thor Ragnarok and What We Do in the Shadows, who's directing, I believe, the last episode of The Mandalorian. Came out this week and said it was going to feel like the original trilogy. So I don't, you know, they they say that, but I, and I don't know exactly what that is supposed to mean, right? I, I feel like when a director says something like, it's going to feel like the original trilogy, like they shot certain aspects of it just with the original trilogy in mind. Um, I believe a lot of it's going to happen on Tatooine, so that'll make it feel like a lot like the original trilogy. Uh, and there was also speculation that Boba Fett's going to come into play at some point in time. There was some piece of... Um, Official information that came out. and Somebody made a comment about running across Boba Fett uh, in The Mandalorian. All right, so here's the Episode Nine stuff. Um, plot info was pretty much non-existent here. They only mentioned that it takes place about a year after The Last Jedi, so there's confirmation on that. They talked about the culmination of the movie being a battle between Rey and Kylo. Okay, so this is where it gets good, right? Because we know that this is legitimate... Um, credible information. Okay. This is a marketing meeting, right? So, the fact that the marketing meeting said that the culmination of the movie, uh, the, talked about the culmination of the movie being a battle between Rey and Kylo. That's pretty big. It means they're not, if they're showing this at a marketing presentation, it means that this is probably going to be somewhat of the focus of the marketing for the film and i'm going to speculate that i also think that's why we're getting the helmet back 
if the movie is about the culmination of the battle between Rey and Kylo, and this is something that is going to be front and center in the marketing, then it makes more sense, especially if we're heading towards Ben Demption, it makes more sense to have Kylo put the mask back on for the beginning of the film when he's at his darkest. That ends up being the images that they use in the marketing, right? This remasked Kylo Ren who's ticked off and that we lose the mask at some point later in the film when we get closer to that ultimate standoff. Because I don't think you're going to have that final battle between Rey and Kylo Ren with his mask on. That would just be a complete waste of Adam Driver's talents. So I found that to be rather interesting. And also, again, makes me wonder if the title of the film is going to be related to that. If the Coma- And again, I, I, I'm, I'm wiping out on this, but I think this is... In the absence of other information, I really do think this is a very relevant detail. Because you have in a marketing presentation, okay, them talking about the culmination of the movie being the battle between Rey and Kylo. Okay? If you're being that upfront with it in a marketing meeting, then I think you're, you know, that's where this movie is going to hinge upon. And that could really relate to the title and also lend a bit of credibility to my idea that the title is going to be potentially controversial in that if it's focusing on this particular battle, then maybe they're going to want some context attached to this. Here's where it also gets a little bit dicey. Not dicey, but I'm just going to throw some more speculation out there. Um, <clears throat> this idea of a MacGuffin that they're searching for. There was a rumor a long while back about a potential baby being involved. So I'm just going to leave that there. I don't want to speculate too far down the road. I just find it fascinating that the marketing meeting pointed to the culmination being a battle between Ray and Kylo. And let's look at, and I'm just, I'm spitballing here, but look at the promotion for Return of the Jedi initially. Right. Initially, the promotion for that had Luke and Vader prominently battling. Right. That's what that that whole thing was was heading. So given how controversial Raylo has been, how controversial The Last Jedi was, I'm wondering if Disney and Lucasfilm are just holding everything at bay until they can perfectly introduce what's going to happen in this film to the public. Okay, I've wiped out enough. They did show a ton of. Of uh, artwork of planets and characters. They said Kylo has his helmet back. And that has been put back together. With some kind of red adhesive. Looked kind of cool with the lines going through it. They also talked about Hooray's lightsaber. And how it's back and has been reforged. They said the reforge is not shown on screen. Okay. Um, I'm with the individuals that are a little bit bummed about that. I That scene. Uh, and I know it takes away from... Well, I mean, you can do it, but the the scene that they cut from Return of the Jedi of Luke in the beginning reforging his lightsaber with the um, with the Force, and um, Vader reaching Luke, Luke for those that have seen the, uh, the the cut footage, I thought that was cool. I really thought that was that was that 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 was pretty amazing to see, and I would have loved to have seen a quick scene of Rey forging you know reforging the uh, the lightsaber but i also understand too that if, if it's going to be a long movie depending on what happens and there's just not time to do that and there's been a year right maybe the reforge took place so long ago during that year that you know in order to show it being reforged you'd have to do a do a flashback quick comment on and this is probably not going to be a popular opinion but on ray's lightsaber um i'm not one to believe that she needs to have a double-bladed lightsaber. Um, I think a double-bladed lightsaber is cool. I like the idea that she's used to using a staff as a weapon. Therefore, her being handy with a double-bladed lightsaber makes the most sense. Um, where I don't like it is I think the standard lightsaber is a lot cooler. Right? Right? Darth Maul is unique with his double-bladed lightsaber and the way he handled it and the way he u- utilizes it. In the times when we see him, whether it's on screen or or in the uh, in the in the comics, 
to see Ray wield the double-bladed lightsaber, I don't think it would look nearly as cool. And if we're going to have Kylo Ren and Ray face off, it's just more from an ex- from, from a um, from a visual standpoint. I think it's a lot more compelling and interesting to have her with the legacy saber or just a standard lightsaber. That's just my opinion. I don't think Ray would be would look as cool having a double bladed lightsaber. I think conceptually it sounds cool, but I think in sort of practical purposes, nah, not so much. All right. Uh, the new droid named Dio, we have confirmation on that. It's sort of a sidekick for BB-8. Uh, it's little and has a sort of cone-shaped head, kind of like a megaphone shape, if you could picture it. Uh, beyond that, it was just a lot of artwork and toy packaging. They mentioned various new planet terrains, but the one I remember was some kind of jungle planet. Anyway, I wish I could remember more details, but this was a little, a little while ago. So, look. There you go. Go check the photos out. Again, go to um, MyNerdWorld.net and click on this week's uh, link. You can uh, you can go and you can see it there. Uh, also, in the, depending on what format you download the podcast, you can go and check it out. Uh, check it out there as well. All right, we have uh, boy, we're a whole hour into the show, and I still have a ton of listener feedback to to get to. Want to remind everybody too that um, after right after the short um, outro to the podcast this week. Uh, talk a little bit about uh, my book, Embark, for those that aren't familiar with it. I ask you if you stick around. If you haven't purchased the book already or you're one of the, you're one of the new listeners, I'll give you a little bit of background on that, and uh, I hope you stick around for it. So in the meantime, let's go ahead and continue, and let's get to our listener feedback portion this week. I need someone to show me my place in all this. And as always, for me, that's you. Thank you to everybody who's left messages on uh, YouTube or emailed me, talkshownerd at gmail.com. Uh, Let's start running through this week's listener feedback. And I do want to say up front, too, that uh, oftentimes, while I read every single comment and email that I get, sometimes for the sake of the show, I'll do some editing for some of the longer emails that I really do appreciate that you guys write. But I do, if you hear your comments back and you go, hey, there was a lot of stuff there in the middle. Uh, it's I have read it, <laughs> but at the same time, um, I do not want to do a four-hour podcast. So, But I appreciate everything you wrote. That sounds like a dick. It wasn't supposed to be. All right. Uh, SJ's says this. I can guarantee uh, guarantee one thing. There was absolutely some things that were not to be compromised on or taken creative freedom on. And one of those things was J.J. telling him that Ben and Ray's fates are intertwined, so you can't kill either one or make their relationship untenable to the point where they would not, where they would want nothing but to murder the other one. To the people who don't like The Last Jedi, you're wrong. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Sorry, I've had some of the, uh, with the growing popularity of the Minor World Star Wars and John Justice podcast, um, some of the uh, more ardent foes of The Last Jedi have found the show. Um, some I respond to, some comments I leave up, a lot of them I remove. I just don't want that garbage on the, on the feed. Everybody's entitled to your, to their opinion. There is just something about the majority of Last Jedi detractors that they, it's not enough that they don't like it. They have to convince you not to like it. I just don't understand that. Okay. Um, anyway, uh, the, what I was trying to say was, before I wiped out, to those who talk about there not being a plan, I don't believe that. The, the, there was an outline. There was a place where all this is, is going. I'll use my own, my own storytelling um, and my own um creating of the stories that I'm writing right now with Embark and the follow up to Embark and what'll be the the third book in the trilogy that I know where the story is going I just don't know exactly how it gets there and I honestly don't even know exactly how it gets there until I start writing the story and it just ends up being pure creation in the moment of what I think is cool and what should what should happen I wrote a scene yesterday another space battle scene because i just love vehicles and space battles and that's the majority of the action although the follow-up to embark has got a lot more than that i've really branched out in terms of the action elements in the in the second book the first one is pretty much all space related or vehicle battle related um but i've been trying to make the action sequences unique right there's only so many different ways you can do a dog fight in space and uh in the middle of crafting the the second book i'm about halfway through right now crafting one of the one of the middle 
um, action sequences. Uh, I came across this really just cool idea that only happened in the middle of when I was writing. For episode nine, Ryan Johnson and to SJ's comment, um, again, things that would not be compromised on, I would word it as Ryan Johnson knew where the story was going and wasn't going to craft a story that compromised what the end game was. I still believe Raylo is the end game. So the last Jedi had to be, what's the middle story going to be that does not compromise that to what SJ was saying and also um, enhances what's going to happen in nine. All right. Moving on. Speaking of nine, Alex writes, I really hope they call episode nine revenge of the Jedi. I would be down with that. As long as there was proper explanation, because I thought George was pretty adamant that originally it was supposed to be Revenge of the Jedi, and um, he changed it because Jedis don't get revenge. So uh, I would like to see uh, exactly what the rationale would be for that. I came up with a title the other day that I liked, and it was The Chosen One. I liked that a lot, because I think it opens up the door to a lot of different possibilities and speculation. And The Chosen One has been such a focal point of all these films that... And it could be applied to so many different people. I think that would be great. But that's just me. All right. Uh, Gay Sagabane says, Adventures of Luke and Young Ben would be a great plot for a new animated series, don't you think? I do. I'm down with that. I'm glad we're getting new animated um, material. It's fun. Uh, Resistance is younger skewing, but I've been enjoying it. Uh, Kelly Langley writes, I think for the whole saga to come full circle, you need to end the Skywalker name on a good note. You can end the Skywalker legacy and it be on a good note. Ben and Ray could be the ones to clean uh, the slate and give it a fresh start. And if they do have children in the future, they could be the one to teach them the proper ways of the Force, the Gray, and uh, in between. One of the other leaks that came out was somebody had hacked the Star Wars website and found a page where it was promoting the IMAX version of Episode Nine, and they had it titled The Balance of the Force, which is also the name of a pinball game. Uh, I don't think it's Balance of the Force, and I don't think that person hacked the website. Uh, I don't think Disney has put anything up yet. According to most of the people involved around the film, they don't even know the title, <laughs> which I don't believe, but be that as it may. All right, uh, Mitzi K writes this. George Lucas himself defines Star Wars as not being science fiction, at least not purely science fiction, or merely that. He said, I knew from the beginning that I was not doing science fiction. I was doing a space opera, a fantasy film, a mythological piece, a fairy tale. I really thought I needed to establish that from the start. And this was a completely made up world so that I could do uh, anything I wanted. There is obviously science fiction elements, but I think the unhappy element of the fandom tend to stubbornly cling to their wish that Star Wars is more science fiction than space opera fantasy fairy tale when the opposite is true. As a very young girl, I devoured fairy tales, Greek mythology, and fantasy stories with magic. Those were the books I read constantly, which I believe is why A New Hope came out when I was 13, that it resonated so much with me and why I have been a loyal fan for almost 42 years now. There have been all parts uh, in all of the movies from episode one to eight that I don't love, but overall I love them all, and I believe that we will have Ben Demption. Um, yeah, you know, to that, uh, I've mentioned before, I know this sounds like a blatant promotion of my book because it is, um, but uh, I've mentioned this before, that you know, the whole reason I wrote my sci-fi novel and I'm writing this trilogy, I wanted to challenge myself for one because I'm horrible at the English language and I'm a much better storyteller out loud than I am putting it down on page. I like to think that I changed that with writing and bark. People seem to enjoy it. By the way, if you do like the sound of my voice, you can also purchase the audiobook, which is about 12 hours long for Embark, available now on Amazon.com if you search uh, E M B R A K, E A B A R K, sorry. Uh, yeah, E M B A R K. Need to spell my own book. And John J O N Justice. Uh, the audiobook is available. Uh, and it's narrated by me. Uh, no, but. You know, I've I mentioned that George Lucas kind of ruined it for everybody because he did do this fantasy element in the galaxy far, far away, but still sort of steeped in the science fiction. And he uh, he provided himself the opportunity to really play with that universe and make it a fairy tale fantasy by establishing it somewhere away from Earth where we don't have to deal with a lot of real world physics. And anybody who goes and does that now is just immediately compared to to Star Wars. Some people have done it successfully, but you are compared to Star Wars. Um that being said, he did also, in my opinion, sort of craft this idea of the space opera. When I wrote Embark, I knew I wasn't going to do it outside of Earth. 
and Earth physics, the whole story, first story of Embark is is really the establishment story of how do how do we end up populating the stars? How do we populate the galaxy so that I can create these other stories? But the term space opera, I think, has provided a bit of flexibility for storytellers like myself and others to, while these are still Earth-based science fiction stories, the readers are still um, willing to allow a little bit of latitude in its believability because we're calling it a space opera. That's certainly what I'm trying to do, adding elements to my story where they are believable from a human capability standpoint because I don't really have anything supernatural in my stories, but still providing enough of that fantasy element to to elevate the story and make it make it fun, apart from it just being sort of straight sci-fi. All right, uh, let's go on. Last of the Wilds writes, Fantastic podcast, awesome content as always. Thank you. He says, by the way, every time you mention Mac Weldon, that we get that special uh, price for the first order. I imagine Supreme Leader Kylo Ren wearing only his Mack Weldon underwear standing in front of his first order shuttle. <laughs> if I had a boyfriend, I would have indeed ordered something. Well, you know what? You should go find a boyfriend in that order. You should order something for your um, boyfriend one day at the special discounted price when you use the promo code MNW at MacWeldon.com. And you should buy it in multiple sizes. That way, you know, depending on you know their, the, the size of your boyfriend. Right. And well, you know, the thing of it is too, again, if you don't like your first order, right, you can you you can keep it and you can, you know, they'll they'll still refund you money. They think you're going to love it that much. There's a lot of uh, accessories on macwalden.com, right, for the ladies as well. So please go to macwalden.com and use that promo code MNW. All right. Jen uh Jenny Reed writes this. Whoa, love the insight from the listener about uh, what might be a little secret from the book? I hadn't picked uh, up on that before. I had thought and heard and read it all. Love sharing my positivity and excitement about Nine with you all. Wouldn't it be awesome if Nine had the best elements from TFA and TLJ combined? That would be epic. Hashtag Raylo is the end game. All right. Uh, yeah, you know, and my apologies. I don't have that comment from last week. I know somebody was talking about the, um, I believe what she's referencing, and I could be wrong was in the novelization of The Last Jedi, um, the specificity of Kylo Ren's connection to Rey as vocalized by Snoke, right? And how he kind of called him out on it. Uh, I think the um, some of the stuff that was cut from The Last Jedi is pretty revealing. When you talk about the um, Raylo, uh, the, one of the lines that was used in the in the uh, Ray and Luke rain fight on Octo when um, you saw it in the uh, director in the Jedi documentary where he says, uh, he says, you know, you, you went, you, you fell for the dark side for a, for a set of pretty eyes kind of thing. It was very revealing of what that relationship was, the level that relationship was supposed to be at. All right. Um, LB writes, uh, thanks always for the wonderful show. Uh, sorry. The haters found you. You shouldn't have to deal with that negative e- energy. Man, I'm a, I've been a talk show host for 22 years. That's nothing. For whatever reason, it annoys me more in the Star Wars universe than it does politically. <laughs> I think it's because I care more about Star Wars than I do politics, which I probably shouldn't say considering I am a uh, full-time talk show host. But let me put it this way. Star Wars is more interesting than politics. Let me go that route. All right. Uh, so she goes on to say this. Um... And speaking of love, Star Wars is definitely a fairy tale. It's said a long time ago, just like fairy tales are once upon a time. There's a princess, swords, and magical power. Maz, Vader, all have castles. They're already seeing a spectacular classic fairy tale being done in Star Wars. Rey and Ben are Beauty and the Beast. A fairy tale that ends with a marriage between his two dual protagonists. I can totally see Ben handing Rey a do-you-like-me note. <laughs> what do you think of my mask? I put it back together myself. Do you like the red? I can do it in green. <laughs> Guy, I want you like you know what? I want that parody so bad. Kind of like I want the cartoon if you haven't the um the emo Kylo Ren Twitter account, which I haven't looked at in forever. Like I would love to see that done, but at the same time, I I'll be honest, I have a hard time when it comes to parodies of Star Wars. I just I I I can enjoy it to a certain extent. But, you know, like, uh, what, Matt the Radar Technician? Is that, is that what the, you know, that's fun. 
And there's a part of me that would really, really love to see sort of an emo Kylo Ren high school Ray romance. I just think that would be hysterical, right? Kylo takes his, his saber to his locker. <laughs> it would be he's just walking around in his helmet all mopey all the time, making her. You know, and they should set it. Oh, I'm gonna wipe out again. They should set it. You'd have to find so what would be the equivalent of making like a mixtape <laughs> in the Star Wars universe, right? Can we do some analog stuff? Ooh, it could be like 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 the uh uh like the like the Death Star plans, right? It could be like on a hard drive. You know, a, I made you this mixed <laughs> I made you this <laughs> I made you this mixed data card of all my favorite songs. They remind me of you. <laughs> And just and Ray just be like what what's whatever freak. <laughs> oh, that would be great. Uh, but eventually she comes around, right? That's what I love. That's what I love, right? That's what I want. Just like in just like in uh, in Attack of the Clones and in Solo, you know. Eventually, you know, Kylo was busy. I knew you liked me all along. <laughs> I knew that that song by Sad Milkshake Weekend would would get right to your heart. <laughs> I included the new Ariana Grande on here. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm digging too deep into my own past. I was one of those idiots at a at a young age during what I call the dark years in the '90s, before I met my wife and got married. Where uh, I, I I just I go back and I think of how stupid I was. Right. That's why I relate so much to Kylo Ren. I think a lot of people do. But you know, to Kylo Ren and his being. I mean, not in the whole murdering everybody deal, but it's, it's sort of this emo love because I was of the opinion, you know, that if I, oh man, if I make this mix mixtape and I put together the right songs in the right order, these, you know, the lyrics of the Cure, Morrissey, and Depeche Mode will reach to her heart and change the way that she feels about me. <laughs> that and their mothers, right? If I can get to their mother and convince their mom to like me, they'll like me too. Okay, um, let's get back to the commentary here. My bad. Stephen Cross Films says this. Hey, John, great show this week. Since J.J. Abrams is finishing up the filming part of Episode 9, I think they also want this movie to put icing on the cake. I can see them releasing the title in a few weeks in the teaser at Celebration in Chicago. I agree. We'll wait and see. I think J.J. Abrams is doing something special in this film. I truly believe that Episode 9 will be one of the best, if not the best, of the saga. Uh, go Team Razor. Forget the Rams. Forget the Patriots. Go Team Raylo. <laughs> All right, Vera Rogue. <laughs> right, can you imagine Kylo Ren, right, uh, at the uh, at the uh, the galactic, uh, uh, you know, sort of droid football game? He's up in the stands while everybody's watching. Ray's a cheerleader, right? Instead of a pom pom, she has her she has her staff, <laughs> and he's up there with his hood on and his coat and his his black outfit with his cape and his helmet on, just heads down. Just you know, he's only there because he wants to watch Ray. <laughs> Okay, sorry. Vera Rogue writes this. So with nothing new to talk about, I had a few questions on my mind that I'm curious to get your uh, your take or others who want to reply. Do you think the vision they saw during the hand touch scene was the same vision slash a shared vision interpreted differently, or did they have separate visions? Oh, um, I think they had separate visions. Uh, and I think the J.J., you know, depending on what they do with that, if they do any, not retconning, but if they do any sort of expansion upon Ray and her family. I mean, J.J. could easily just leave it alone. The what Ryan, that what uh, Kylo Ren saw was right, you know, filthy junk traders, and traded her, you know, traded her in for, for drinking money. But there's certainly a lot of wiggle room there, especially when you go back to a lot of comments that Yoda's made in, in previous films of, you know, always, uh, you know, you know, the future, you know, cloudy, it can be. Always in motion is the future, this kind of thing. It's always in motion, right? Not emotion, right? It's always in motion. Is you know, I'm gonna look that up real quick because I, you know, I'm surprised I don't know that. Yeah, I was right. Always in motion is the future. I, I, I knew that. I just wanted to be be be, be certain. All right. Uh, second question and a follow up to that: the way they each described their visions was what they saw in the throne room scene, or are we to assume it's something different that occurs later in the future? If you listen to them, they could easily be describing what happens in the throne room. Ray, you will not, uh, Ray, you will not bow to Snoke. Uh, Ky uh, Kylo counters, you'll stand with me. Both of which happen in the throne room. Yeah, you know, and that to me, again, if that is the case, which I believe it could be, I think that was the intent. 
leave the comment somewhat ambiguous to where it could apply to what's happening in the throne room. But if J.J. Abrams and Chris Terrio want to do anything with it, they still can. Okay. Um, let's see. Three. I find, uh, I find this interesting, and it's something I just noticed after rewatching The Last Jedi the other day. But when Rey goes for the lightsaber after Kylo's proposal, they both fight to get it. What I've realized, and not sure if it was by design, but Kylo could have instead went for his red lightsaber and then could have dueled again. But he didn't. And in my mind, perhaps, he wanted to avoid that kind of confrontation with her. Just interesting to think he may have been trying to defuse the situation rather than fight her food for thought. Yeah, no, I absolutely believe that was the case. You know, that throne room scene is just, it's just amazing. Uh, it's still, the, 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 the top to bottom dynamic of that entire scene it's just incredible, right? It's as a it's a, it's the grown up version for me of awesomeness that would have been good guys getting in, you know, rebels getting in Tie Fighters. Like to me, that just you well, rebels don't get in Tie Fighters. That to me is just cool. Or even a stormtrooper getting in an X wing fighter, right? Just from a from a sort of awesomeness level, right? As a kid, that was cool. As a grown up, seeing this moment where these two individuals decide to team up, subverting expectations, kill the main bad guy, and then fight together. Yeah. And I think that, uh, absolutely, I think that was intentional, that Kylo Ren left his lightsaber after he after he dropped it. There was no need for him to, there was no need for him to go and pick it up and fight Rey. You know, he, he at the moment, I think it was a spur of the moment decision, or maybe, so I know this is up for speculation, something that he was planning for a long, long time to do. Um... But then once they took out the Snoke and the Praetorian guards, he thought, okay, you know, there's no, Ray's not a threat. We just battled together, right? And she wasn't a threat. I know she went for the lightsaber, but I'm not 100% sure that she went for that lightsaber because she wanted to strike him down or she just wanted to get away. I, I think that's open for interpretation as well. All right. Uh, let's see. Court, uh, uh, Court Vader Books says this. Two words, reverse Anadala. Yep, I agree too. All right. Um, Sky Graphic has a couple of comments here. I do not wish for Star Wars to become Marvel, based off of commentary we had last week. I don't want it to become a joke without any depth. You see, the only Marvel movie I really take seriously is Deadpool, because with him, the humor fits, and it's still, and they still touch your heart, while all the other movies feel like quick, uh, flat cash grabs. Um, just imagine a Disney movie made with Frozen slash Tangled animation. How awesome would that be? Totally agree. And how greatly would that bring the, bring the children back in? Yes, absolutely. Damn, that would be cool. Yeah, man, I want to see the original trilogy done in that style. That would be... Oh, I can't... Oh, my God, give it to me now. Give me the original trilogy done in a fun, animated style. Right? Minus the songs. I always thought the First Order ghost, the first, let me back up here, sorry. I always thought the Thing Force ghost Luke told Leia was the connection between Rey and Ben, or something about Han, because this is eventually what makes Leia hope again. This was been, would be when Luke saw Leia on uh, on Crate. All right, uh, thank you for the comments there, I appreciate that. Um, Sparkly Pegs writes this, I would not be surprised if it was Snoke that put those visions inside Ben's head for Luke to see. Ben wanted to please the family that he loves. Instead, they feared the power he has inside of him. And as we all know, fear leads to anger, anger leads to hate, and hate leads to suffering. He wanted to be a great pilot like his dad. He wanted to be a great Jedi like his uncle. He craved his family's approval. And so what better way to tip a kid over the edge than by showing him his own uncle could be willing to kill him? Uh, yeah, I, I, tend to, uh, I tend to agree. Um, moving on in the comment here. Uh, the other point I've noticed is all the main characters that have died have died old. Obi-Wan, Yoda, Vader, Han, Luke. Ben is young. It seems really cruel to put a kid through all that torture, then kill him just as he finally comes back to the light. To the light. I truly hope they don't do the Luke saves Vader, Vader dies scenario all over again. What a sad, sad way for the son of two of our favorite Star Wars heroes to go out. And what a sad way for the Vader fam Skywalker story to end. I'd hate it. Ben Solo needs to be the reverse Vader to bring this whole story full circle. Um, Real quick on that. Uh, great points, by the way. But when it comes to the redemption of Ben Solo, um, 
that's a, and again, and this goes without saying, it's kind of a difficult one because, like, the only I don't want to say the only satisfying ending, but like a satisfying ending would obviously be Ben finding somebody, right? Like Ben finally getting Ray and being with Ray. That makes the most sense to me. Because I was thinking, well, what if Ben is redeemed, but he decides to go off on his own right at the end? He needs to separate himself from everything, you know, because of the balance, the whole balance aspect of it. He, you know, did go and murder a bunch of people, even though, you know, we did get a redemption of, of Vader. But with his redemption and him living, it creates a different scenario. You know, I'm kind of thinking, like, well, where would he go, right? I mean, would he go to Corellia, where his dad was? There's no family there. Um would he go, you know, what back to Naboo? I, I, you know, that's a that's a tough one. I, to me, again, it makes the most sense for him to end up with Ray and Ray and him going off by themselves somewhere or going back to an original location, right, to Luke's homestead or or something that has some significance to to Ben Solo. All right, uh, let's see uh, where are we at. We are at you are living. You are living three two one. Hi, I'm sorry if this is a dumb question and I'm new here, but did you edit that intro yourself or is it someone else's YouTube video, specifically the beginning bit where Kylo talks and, and Vader after him? No, I made that edit. It's one of the um it's one of the first teaser trailers for The Force Awakens and then I dubbed in some of the original um dialogue uh to add a little bit more to it and then uh actually changed the end of it recently because I kept getting dinged for playing the um the song from Maz Kanata's Castle, and they kept getting YouTube violations for it, so I ended up changing it. Uh, Anna Schaefer writes this, I think it would be cool to have a kind of death rebirth theme for the next movie. My idea, especially tying into Star Wars being a nod to mega myths and fairy tales, would be to have Kylo Ren die in some kind of sacrifice that he decides to on his own so that it wouldn't be Ray changing his mind or saving his soul and having Ray use a dark transfer to bring him back from death and the brink of death. Think about it this way. Having Kylo die and reborn as Ben would satisfy a lot of fan camps, the ones who say Kylo's got to go and the ones who say uh, Ben can be redeemed. It also fits with the death, rebirth, purification portions of the hero's journey and is a form of the Christ story. Also, it it satisfies both Ben and Ray's visions of each other's futures from the last Jedi, dark transfers are dark side skills, so that Ray would need to access her dark side to save Ben, just like Kylo's vision, and it would also satisfy Ray's vision, where Ben triumphs over dark si- over the dark side. It's also a little reminiscent of the 1991 Beauty and the Beast, which might be a nice nuanced gesture towards the mythic fairy tale vibe and the Disney universe. I dig it. Thank you for the comment, Anna. Appreciate it. Uh, new listener uh, Carlos Andres says, "Loving your channel. Thank you, Carlos." I didn't know what to make of the hateful fandom, and some places like this one make me feel happy, and I like Star Wars. Thanks, man. You're a really nice guy, and that's pretty hard to find. Uh, Carlos goes on to say, MCU is fine, but I wish the Star Wars universe follows its own narrative. Yeah, and I get what people are saying. That was in comments to um, you know, my, 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 my thought that one day they could go sort of an MCU route where we get the saga films with the uh, sort of a more linear fashion. So um, I can certainly understand people's desire to keep star wars unique and i'm down with that um agnes writes this when i was reading the novelization of the last jedi Oct two struck me as the perfect place for ben and ray to finish their journey indeed the last scene is very hopeful when the nuns know the jedi will come again as they have always come to the island and then i'm listening to songs on spotify put there uh, by disney as the Kylo Ren song library. I listen to Satellite by Rise Against, and I love these parts of the lyrics. We'll sneak out when they sleep and sail off in the night. We'll come clean and start over the rest of our lives. When we're gone, we'll stay gone, out of sight, out of mind. It's not too late. We have the rest of our lives. For me, it's the picture of Ben and Ray on Octo. Thank you for your podcast. You have turned me into a hardcore Star Wars fan. Yes. Goal achieved. Um, I like that idea, too. And if I am thinking of the of seven and eight right now correctly, not everybody should know where Octu is, right? They found the map. Ray went there with Chewie, so Chewie would know where it is. But Chewie would certainly keep that a secret. Yeah, I mean, you're talking about a location that was, for the most part, right, the most unfindable place in the galaxy. So technically, not everybody knows where it is. So that would make 
somewhat of sense. Certainly would be a heck of a lot nicer than Tatooine. Right? There's a lot of sand there. I don't know if you know the thing about sand. Is that it's coarse and it's rough. And it gets everywhere. <laughs> Man, I, you know, the fact that I could sneak in. I know it's a Star Wars podcast. But the fact that I could sneak in an actual like Attack of the Clones reference. And it was relevant. It really makes me happy. I feel like I've succeeded. Uh, an hour and 30 minutes into this week's podcast. Where we had no official news. Unbelievable. I love Star Wars. All right. One more comment. And then we'll wrap this, this thing up. Uh, the intro maker says this. Um... Let's see. I do believe the big picture in these movies is the darkness rises and the light to meet it. But in terms of what is going to happen in episode nine, my predictions are Ben is the next inhabitant of Octo. Hey, going back to Agnes. Uh, and the secret between Luke and Leia is the knowledge ch- uh, of the child of Ben and Ray will be born. Yeah. Man, I'm just excited. Let me check over. You know, I'm going to give one last look at Reddit leaks before I wrap up the show this week in case something new has uh, popped up that I've uh, that that I've missed. Nope, nothing there. We'll go to the speculation page, see if anything has uh, has popped up there. Um, and again, go to uh, mynerdworld.net if you want. If you haven't uh, gone there yet, you can see the photos that I was referencing. Curious to get uh, to get your thoughts on that on these uh, photos that have uh, that have come out. Um, what you think of Kylo Ren? Um, and you know what? Most specifically, I'm going to leave you with any type of. Uh, um, if I leave you with any type of homework assignment this week, right, um, apart from purchasing Embark, which I'm going to talk about here in just a moment, um, to me, okay, the biggest takeaway from the show this week is the putting the pieces together and that marketing um, leak that came out that said that the culmination of the movie was going to be a battle between Ray and Kylo Ren. I think that's the biggest news this week, that we have confirmation that that is most likely true. And that was said in a marketing meeting. So what does that mean for you? Because I know a lot of you have written that, you know, talking about this idea of a final confrontation between Ray and and, and Kylo. Uh, I believe it's going to happen, but I'm curious what you think it means and how that plays out. Especially when we know we've got Richard E. Grant, who's playing this First Order officer, probably in a prominent role. Carrie Russell sounds like might be in a prominent role, might even be a knight, a knight of Ren. We've got Matt Smith and some rumors that he's a bad guy and the Knights of Ren. So <clears throat> I'm really curious, and I'm going to save some of my commentary, further commentary on that for next week. But talkshownerd at gmail.com. Leave a comment on YouTube. Um, again, the marketing says that this movie is the culmination. Uh, the culmination will be a battle between Ray and Kylo. What does that mean for you? Your thoughts on Raylo? And the, the, you know, are you, are you good with that? Are you good? If the marketing comes out and that's, that's what the focus is, a squaring off between these two. And if they do it, it's probably going to be the image of Kylo Ren with that helmet put back together, right? Let me know what you think. Again, leave a comment on YouTube. Uh, drop me an email, talkshownerd at gmail.com. You can find uh, me on Twitter at the my nerd world, um, or at John, J-O-N, Justice. Uh, Spreaker, Stitcher, Podbean, iTunes. Uh, let's see, what am I missing? Spreaker, Stitcher, Podbean, iTunes, YouTube. Right? Is that right? I think that covers uh, that covers all of them. Go subscribe uh, and uh, go pick up the book. I'm going to talk about that here in uh, in just a moment. But thank you so much for checking out the show this week. I look forward to all of your comments on next week's show. It was a long one. I hope you don't mind. Uh, and I guess that's it. So uh, stick around after the short outro. Uh, and I have a, a, a special message about Embark. Other than that, thank you so much, as always, for checking the show out and all of your comments. I appreciate it. Have yourself a fantastic week. Bye. The Force will be with you. Always. My nerd world. In the future, car culture is replaced by air and space flight. Earth is now at risk. Mechanic, Taft Guardia, fights to save humanity and the girl he loves. If this uh, is new to you, if the podcast is new to you, thank you so much for checking it out. I recently wrote a novel called Embark. Uh, I did it because of my love of Star Wars and I wanted to create my own set of characters, uh, stories, and worlds uh, just like George Lucas did. Uh, The book's been out since November uh, it's uh, been very successful so far. I'm really happy with the response that I've been getting. Yesterday, I had one of the coolest things happen. My 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 youngest son, I have a 16 and 12 year old, uh, went to the movies to go see Lego Movie 2, which was really funny, by the way. Um, but 
a buddy of his, who I think is 12 or 13, is reading the book and is so jazzed about it, talking about how he can't put it down and how much fun he's having reading it. And um, I wrote the story so that it would be enjoyable for adults and kids as well. It has a sweet romance at its center. I talked about that a little bit earlier in the show. Uh, and it is the setup. It is the it is this trilogy's origin sort of story. You know, instead of jumping in after, you know, the big events that put everybody in a particular place, I wanted to tell the story of the big event up front. Uh, and that's what Embark is. It's available right now on uh, Amazon. You can pick it up for two ninety nine in the ebook, thirteen ninety nine for the uh, paperback. The audiobook is free with an Audible trial, seven forty nine if you purchase the ebook at two ninety nine, and then I believe twenty four dollars just as the regular price on our, uh, on Audible. I did narrate the book as well. Uh, it's about twelve hours long, so. Uh, if you like the podcast, if you enjoyed the podcast, and I could, would really appreciate the support and a purchase of the book would really um, be uh, absent of Mac Weldon sponsoring because right now they're they're done with their sponsorship. I still like to promote them because they've taken the time out on the show, but I've given them a lot of freebies. If you really want to support the show and you like what the show um, is and you enjoy it, uh, even if you're not a big reader, go put, uh, purchase the ebook for a friend. Um, I'm t if you're a Star Wars fan, you'll like Embark. It is the movie that I would want to go to the movie theater to see if it wasn't a Star Wars movie. That's what the, that's what the story is. I'm halfway through. The follow-up should be done here in a couple of months. Can't wait to get the story out there. I'm really excited for the second story. But you got to get through the first one, um, the first one obviously, uh, before the second one comes out. So go pick it up at Amazon. Search for Embark, John J. Owen Justice. Also, when you go to MyNerdWorld.net, if you want to go look at that um, leaked photo with all the different photos from Episode 9, you can hit the link there as well. And again, buy it for a friend. I don't get a ton of money off the, um, off the royalties right now. Uh, my uh, the uh, my selling of the book is to keep its profile on Amazon up for when the follow up comes out later this uh, later this year. Uh, the book sells better the higher it up it is in rotation in, in the um, in the rank in the rankings. And uh, I would really appreciate it if you want to go and support the show again. Get it for yourself. Buy it for a friend if you haven't uh, if you haven't already. So thank you so much. Check it out. Hope you enjoy it. And if you have read it or if you purchased it and you read it and you like it, please go and leave a positive review on Amazon. I really would appreciate it. Again, uh, uh, E M B A R K M Bark E M B A R K John J O N Justice on Amazon or go to mynerdworld.net. Thank you as always for checking the show out, and I will talk to you again uh, last week. And thank. Thank you or next week. And thank you for the support. Bye.